From our 22 News Broadcast Center, this is 22 News in Focus. There's a new attitude around here, I think. I mean, I think there's a real positive attitude around here now. People are really kind of seeing that something is happening down here. They're feeling the vibe that's happening down here, and, and it really is exciting. It said the city of Springfield is experiencing a renaissance, a rebirth, a reawakening to a city that was once the center of economic development at the crossroads of New England. I'm Kate Walsh, host of 22 News In Focus. Take a look around me here at Main Street. Though this is just one throughway in the city of Springfield, what happens here impacts every neighborhood and this is changing by the day. In this special edition of 22 News In Focus, we'll look at the future of economic success for the city, as well as the current state of affairs in terms of safety and security, health and education, as well as what makes people so proud to call this city of homes their home. You know, people ask me, Kate, they go, why did they call that section the Hollywood section. Well, I told him at one time uh, that was a preeminent pre-condo thing after the war, po post uh, uh, World War II. There was a waiting list to get in there. That was really a honeymoon area. It was an exclusive area. And that's why it was called the Hollywood section at the time. It went through some tough, troubled times. For years, shooting, stabbings, nightly drug deals plagued Springfield's Hollywood section. The neighborhood off Main Street in the city's south end far from the romantic post-war picture of the city's golden years. But a renaissance is upon us, or so the city hopes. In just over a year, this very neighborhood, now known as Outing Park, will border nearly $1 billion of economic development with MGM Springfield. The resort-style casino comes with the promise its urban design will encourage millions of visitors to explore not just the gaming floor, but downtown. What better way to truly test the safety and appeal of this area than by taking you on a walking tour with Springfield's mayor, Dominic Sarno. It's a case study in this hour of exploration of the city, its public safety issues, economic development opportunities, innovation, education, health and well-being of the city's residents. We met the mayor on Marble Street. At the end of this dead end street is a housing project and the new $11 million South End Community Center at Emerson White Park set to open this summer. That's going to program the whole area. The more positive action traffic, foot traffic, and vehicular traffic you have, the better it's going to be. These were always isolated areas, one-way streets. When you go into Outing Park, there were one-way streets here, there, and now we're uh, uh, shedding the light on the good things that are going on, but also sending a message for any individuals that want to perpetrate negative activities that we're going to run you out of town. So would, it's gotten better. Would you say this is uh, Crime-wise, one of the worst, so to speak, parts of at the At one city. time, at one time. That positive action includes demolishing this housing project. But there was always water table issues here, and that the the housing is is uh, um, not up to par with these families deserve. So they're going to be relocated to much better housing. In turn, these are coming down, and then traffic reconfiguration is going to occur. Kate, we're, from Central Street, we're going to run a road, a street all the way back here, again, to put more eyes and ears. So where would the people that live here be housed? Are there open lot, open spaces? Well, they'll have, they have different vouchers that they can go for on affordable housing. And Judge Abraskin, Hank Abraskin, the Springfield Housing Authority has been great. He has been a partner. He understands the vision. He's also been tremendous when it comes to getting educational programs, scholarship programs, and other computer programs in, because a lot of the, uh, the subsidized housing, it's not just all for older people or seniors, mm. which he has programs there. There's a lot of young families there. So he's showing them a way that hopefully this is just transitional, uh, that you'll be able to get on your feet and, and have your own place uh, moving forward. Mayor Sarno hopes the new South End Community Center will play the same role the old South End Community Center played for decades in providing programs for children to stay out of trouble and lead prosperous lives. The old South End Community Center, damaged in the June 1st, 2011 tornado, will now become a restaurant or bar on MGM Springfield's property. This new center was delayed for more than five years after the tornado because the city required federal approval to build it on park land. It's costing $4 million of city tax money and $6.2 million from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, due to the old center's destruction in the tornado. 
But as we watched construction at work, my photographer and I noticed kids riding their bikes on a school day morning. There was a kid riding his bike who clearly should have been in school and was bragging to his friends that he got suspended. And yeah. right across the street is the community center yeah. where they're supposed to be helping kids. So. Yeah, you know what? Uh, things like that aggravate me. But in this case here, maybe he sees the center's open, goes into the center, and the first thing Chase One or their staff will say is that, how come you're not in school? Well, I, okay, and then a phone call will go to the school. As we walked down Marble Street toward Outing Park, formerly the Hollywood section, we noticed dumpsters filled with trash, liquor bottles littering the street, and houses still in disarray. But when we approached Outing Park, it looked much more well kept. And then bringing first resource in, Gordon Pulse, for one company controlling this, the marked improvements here in the housing, the camera system, they have their own little community center that they open up. Crime is down. We have C3 policing units that are here. And you can see, you can see what transformation. We'll get to C3 policing and its success later in this program, but Mayor Sarno said crime was down 13% overall last year in the city due to private and public investment and fixing up blighted properties. We cut down density here, we knocked down, I had apartment complexes knocked down that we felt were a public safety issue. That started the tailspin. Now there's a clearing from the former Hollywood section to Main Street, which is transforming daily. Glory uh, uh, Shoes, which was on the corner of uh, Bliss Street and Main Street, relocated down here uh, as an anchor. And we knock, I knocked down some properties there that were derelict. They're doing very, very well. Uh, down there with that and uh, so they relocated from the MGM complex but I had some derelict buildings I wanted to open up eyes and ears the main street because this was, this was a secluded area and in the distance a symbol of hope for economic recovery and success to see those cranes I mean, cranes in the skyline what it means to people whether they see it from I-91 or if you're way up on Maple Street you see, it's a sign of progress, and people are saying to me from within and out, wow, there's a lot of stuff going on, not only in downtown area, but all across the city. With the Greens as our North Star, we walked down Main Street toward the future MGM Springfield. But around us were still some empty storefronts. But there's a barrel right here. Okay. Okay. An intersection still well known to police officers. Sometimes you'll see some of these crimes that are occurring are fueled by uh, drug situations uh, on it. And that's why I've continued to push the bail legislation for those uh, hardcore violent repeat offenders uh, that they uh, keep them locked up and off the streets. Do you foresee more businesses trying okay. to be built here on Main Street once morning. MGM opens? Yeah, see, here's the thing. When you talk to... Uh, like uh, Nick Risha at Milano's and, and others down here. For, he says business has been booming. He goes, now I do breakfast now because of construction people that are here. So a smart businessman or smart businesswoman, and you have a good product, good quality, and you're able to market, you're gonna have thousands of people, not only vehicular traffic, more importantly, Kate, pedestrian traffic. See, my goal is we have a very walkable downtown. So the governmental section, but I want the goal to be all of a sudden, you're walk coming to the south end. When people are visiting the casino, and obviously the casino is set up that way so yeah. that it's part of the city, would would you ideally want other businesses to be here for them I, to come I in? think what you start to see is a, I, at times they say it's a bad word, but you start to see a regenerification occurring. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't want to be, uh, as we continue to move on 31 Elm Street, uh, all due respect to a pawn shop or this or that, you know, you can be re look to relocate in a different uh, type area. That's not going to be conducive. And when you, what you'll see at the time is that you bring in uh, the more positive uh, uh, body or people that are here for experience and have some disposable money. You're going to see more of an eclectic mix. So almost by osmosis, that'll start to that'll start to change. The city is relying on MGM Springfield to revitalize this downtown by attracting millions of visitors each year and providing funds through its host community agreement to make it all possible. This is an iconic destination. Mm -hmm. People come out and they say, geez, I don't want to wait there. I, you know what, I, I'd rather, streetscape is going to be important, aesthetic quality, 
uh, from improvements of, of flowers and inside the whole nine yards. If you keep it clean and safe, we're going to have all those policing aspects all the way up and down from Mill Street to Union Station. People will feel very comfortable and say, I heard, let's go get grab some pastry at La Florentina. Well, let's, t let's take a walk to Milano's or let's go to Frigo's right? and walk out. Now all of a sudden you're going to have a captive audience. After an hour of walking through the downtown, we headed back to Marble Street to find many people enjoying the day outside at Emerson White Park. We walked around unattended. There was no entourage with me. There are no police officers with me. I'm here with the beautiful and talented Kate Walsh, Miriam Sullivan, my uh, director of communications, press secretary, Mike. That's it. Nothing scripted. Did you see one issue? Did you see one problem? Okay, that's important to get out there to the, uh, to the public with some of the uh, nonsense that is uh, said, uh, said or uh, uh, put out uh, with no backup whatsoever from some of the naysayers. Main Street may be the most visible part of Springfield, but MGM Springfield is actually contributing just about a third of the $3.3 billion in economic development coming to the city. In this hour of 22 News in Focus, we'll look at the new and longtime economic drivers, as well as what's being done to make sure everyone who lives here and visits here stays safe. We're starting to uh, see a small increase of activity in the, in the opposite side of the tracks on the Main Street corridor. So we're focusing a lot of attention there. And I think we've, I think we've made significant progress, obviously, when, when you see a 22% decrease in the, in the crime rate from last year to this year and 13% uh, citywide. I think that would be a sterling example. What we're doing here is working. You're in a front row seat at the Springfield North End C3 Policing Weekly Meeting. Every Thursday, it's held at Edgewater Apartments off Plainfield Street or at Sacred Heart Church. C3 means Counter Criminal Continuum. It all began eight years ago when members of the North End community met monthly with police. Commissioner John Barbieri was a deputy chief at the time. And attendance was very sparse. Uh, Jose Claudio from the New North Citizens Council, uh, some of the local and state representatives, some of the people from city government, and usually the property managers, and only one or two tenants, and we're having a real hard time getting people to come to the meetings. And then, unfortunately, we had a, a spate of really serious violence in the North End. There were several homicides, including one involving assault rifles. We responded in kind to the neighborhood with you know, 10 man police patrols, which I personally led at the time as a deputy chief, carrying our own assault rifles, and we made arrests and we started to work on the problem. But that's traditional policing. Traditional policing is you saturate an area, you heavy enforcement, you make as many arrests as possible. But I knew that the long term solution was going to have to be something different because we really couldn't afford to be down there in those kind of numbers every night. That's when state police trooper Michael Cotone had an idea. Just come, coming back from a deployment uh, from Iraq in uh, 06, uh, myself and another trooper, Tom Saroof, uh, from our experiences with the Army Special Forces and what we've done in the town of Afghani, where we utilize uh, the local police to uh, fight counterinsurgency, we took those principles of community building and we just brought them back home. It might seem extreme military special forces tactics used in a war zone to be used on a city, but it's worked. When we're looking around this table, I'm the only one from the 70s and the 80s here. And I tell you, it has, been, it has improved. We don't order the cops around. They don't order us around. We sit down and have ideas. C3 policing meetings started back in 2009 here in the North End, but they've since been enacted in other communities, including the South End, Forest Park, and Mason Square. C3 is, a, is designed to roll out to your neighborhoods that are most impoverished and are most, that have the greatest need for services. And when we selected the areas after the North End, um, we were pretty strict about the guidelines. It wasn't just where we thought we should go, we did research. It was about crime statistics, of course, but it was also about truancy, poverty, um, hospital usage rates. Uh, we had our crime analysis deep dive, but what we discovered is, you know, as you would probably imagine, uh, it wasn't counterintuitive. Most of those spots just layered right on top of each other. Here's how a meeting works. The police officer assigned to that neighborhood starts with a list of the crimes and people arrested in the past week. If that name sounds familiar, it's because we've arrested them in the past. Mm -hmm. 
probably about five times already. Anyone is welcome to attend and each has a chance to share an update or concern with the group. There are some 80 local organizations involved in this one, as well as presidents of tenants associations who relay the message of the meeting back to the tenants. On this particular day, that included an announcement from Pride that they would be donating $2,000 in a scholarship for a kid in the neighborhood. <laughs> We heard from friends of the homeless, local schools, residents, parents, and even a representative from the Pioneer Valley Riverfront Club. I'll be honest, uh, over 60% of my participants are not from Springfield, and some of them are from pretty upscale communities. With the support of C3, both the words and the actions, these parents, these families, these schools have no problem bringing their kids uh, to our neighborhood to enjoy outdoor activity in the north end of Springfield. I mean, who would have thought, right? It's really a simple concept, and it's getting national attention. Just ask Jose Claudio of the New North Citizens Council. He's lived in the north end for a long time. Uh, over 50 years. Through our experience, people are hesitant to report crimes or talk about crimes in their neighborhood out of fear of retaliation or involvement. But Claudio said they are helping police now more than ever in making arrests. The C3 model, there's a couple um, th steps that you have to follow. And a lot of people may not report to you, but they got anonymous tips, they got anonymous phone numbers that they call people, and they could call the, the what's good about this, that they could call, call the police, you know, like, so we, are, we call Sergeant Toledo here, but they could call him directly, his big beeper, they could talk to him directly, quietly, and they do all that quietly, which is also awesome. Yeah. And have you found that the community is coming together more? People are talking to each a, other? A, a lot more. A lot more than ever. When you, when you build a house and people want to come and buy and you sell it in less than 30 days, you know the neighborhood is coming back. Are those people who lived in apartments in the neighborhood and they're moving yes, to houses? Yes, to houses. And other people coming out, out of the other areas moving into the neighborhood. More proof this model is working in the community. On this day, the biggest concern wasn't a murder or even a missing person. It was complaints of snow removal from a recent storm. Still, the city is dealing with repeat offenders back on the streets. Mayor Sarno has been very vocal in making sure they stay out of neighborhoods. We had a run which you covered it was probably a year, year and a half ago, mm -hmm. uh, where we had violent repeat offenders, bad people, uh, uh, you, gun uh, toting, uh, gang bangers, drug dealers, that for some rhyme or reason were right back on the streets in a matter of time and uh, committing crime, even with bracelets and monitors are committing those hideous crimes. That hurts a neighborhood when we've cultivated positive relationships and they'll say to me, hey, mayor, or Sarno, or Dominic, or Commissioner Barberi, or others. We worked with you. Mm -hmm. We helped you get this bad person off the street, and they're right back on there. So what have you done to make sure that they stay in jail or prison longer? Well, I, again, I, I think you know using the bully pulpit's been important, but I didn't want to keep yelling and screaming all the time. Chief Scott did this in Holyoke. I met with all the legal eagles and said, what's the, where's the loopholes here? What's occurring? He's working with Springfield State Representative Angelo Pupolo in writing legislation for stricter bail restrictions for accused criminals. They have the right, if they don't like what has been dished out to them in uh, a district court type setting, they have the right to uh, uh, appeal that and kick it up to uh, a superior court on the bail restrictions of bail. And if they don't like it there, they have the right to kick it to a st state Supreme Court justice, single one, on that. We the people, we the people have no such right. So I'm looking for an even playing field. In addition to and before C3 policing, communities relied on their faith foundations to work together, create peace, and help those in need. Faith foundations like St. John's Congregational Church in the city's Old Hill neighborhood. We see on an average anywhere from 400 to 600 people each Sunday. Reverend Dr. Calvin McFadden is a partner with C3 Policing in the neighborhood, but says his congregation alone brings hope to a part of the city that could use some. One of the things that we encourage people to do is not to leave what we have experienced in these four walls in this place, uh, to take that joy, to take that level of commitment of service to our community out into our society uh, so that we can better our society. Uh, many of our people live right in our community and even abroad, uh, abroad in the uh, regional area, uh, and they give back to the community, and that's um, really their way of, of giving God 
praise and honor for their lives, but also being a blessing to other people. And St. John's has a history of doing that. We have our food pantry uh, that's open several days during the week, providing food to needy persons in our community. We provide a hot meal on Wednesday evenings for anyone who comes. And so we believe that ministry is not just within this sacred space, but it's everywhere that we go. Member Denise Jordan has lived in Springfield her whole life, works for the mayor, and is a part of this congregation. One thing about Old Hill, I always say this is like holy ground. There are at least seven houses of worship in this neighborhood. And so, you know, it's not uncommon for the churches to come together, you know, for prayer vigils and for walks. But, you know, there's a church just about on every other corner in Old Hill. That's why when the congregation was set to build a new worship space, it wasn't even a question for Reverend McFadden to keep it in this neighborhood. In fact, this house of worship was built just across the street from the original. We made a conscious decision at St. John's, rather than moving outside of the city to build this facility that we're in, uh, an over $3 million investment in our community, we wanted to stay right here in the community because we believe that this will help perhaps um, brighten the hope of folks within the community, add, uh, let folks know that we're here to serve, let folks know that we're here to make a, a difference in our community. An investment in the community, both financially and in spirit, both helping to spruce up a neighborhood riddled with crime and poverty. Fire service is community service and uh, our firefighters are out there and they, they interact with the community very well, especially our public education and fire prevention. We've done uh, 200 public education uh, presentations up to this point in the year, in the fiscal year, and we've done almost 600 inspections at different buildings. So our firefighters are out in the public on a day-to-day -day basis and, and we very rarely have any negative feedback from that. We can't talk about public safety without focusing in on the Springfield Fire Department. Especially in Springfield, uh, we are still a very busy department as far as fires go, but we do many other things. Medical calls, we respond to about 7,000 medical calls a year for chest pain, difficulty breathing, heart attacks, uh, those types of emergency calls. We also go to car accidents with extrications. We go to hazmat incidents. We go to uh, water or ice rescues. When disaster struck in the form of the EF3 tornado on June 1st, 2011, Springfield firefighters were there, as they were again at the Worthington Street gas explosion a year later on Black Friday. Yet Commissioner Joseph Conant said they're trying to do more with less. Challenges. Uh, you know, keeping, keeping the personnel up. Uh, you need, no matter what type of equipment you have, how good the equipment is, you still need firefighters to drag the hose into the building and to do, uh, you know, do the work of firefighting. With 242 firefighters, the department is at its highest number in years, but not nearly what it used to be. We were up to 500 almost at one point. Uh, I think when I came on, there was 491. Um, so it's been a dramatic hit over the years, but uh, the, the, the firefighters that we have now do a tremendous job at, at, at what we do and the calls that we have to go on and getting the job done every single day. Springfield Fire currently has eight working engines, down from 10. Each engine has two district chiefs per shift. Despite budget cuts, Commissioner Conan is always looking for ways to best spend your limited tax money on state-of-the-art equipment. When I took over, we were we went from a class two to a class three fire department right before I took over for insurance purposes. And we just got notified we're going back up to a class two. So that's a huge uh, endeavor. That, I mean, that's through training, equipment, and personnel, we've been able to uh, move our rating back up from a class three to a class two department. And how does that rating work? Like what it, goes into it? It goes into, they, they take uh, in account your water system, dispatch, training, personnel, equipment, and they, they build that all into a score and it, it directly affects the insurance rates of the uh, citizens of Springfield. So going from a class three to a class two is a big step for the department. So basically you're paying less for insurance. Correct. Commissioner Conan said Mayor Sarno has never laid off a firefighter due to budget cuts. However, the mayor did make a controversial decision not to re-sign the commissioner's contract after this one ends. Not for budget cuts, but for disciplinary reasons. I think I Everybody knew where I stood on this issue. It was very public, very public, and uh, uh, that's what had to be done. It was not done, and uh, I had to act accordingly. Mayor Sarno announced earlier this year that he would not renew Commissioner Conant's contract as punishment for the commissioner not disciplining Deputy Fire Chief Glenn Geyer. Geyer violated current city ordinance by not moving to Springfield within a year of his promotion. It's on the books. 
uh, that's a situation uh, that if you're going to become a deputy uh, chief that you have to uh, be a resident of the city of uh, Springfield. I appreciate uh, what Commissioner Conant um, has done. We worked a lot side by side and uh, uh, Mr. Geyer uh, had every right in the world uh, uh, to appeal to a higher authority and if that higher authority, uh, whether on the state level indicated uh, there was not any type of issue there, then abide it. But I have to stay consistent. I have to stay consistent. This was uh, on uh, the books. If you're going to become a, a, a deputy chief, you have to live in the city of Springfield, as with I've done with the police department. And, and if you don't, and, and that's that's the issue there. You know, we always want to get the the best person for the taxpayer, but I have to stay consistent. Well, I know the district chiefs, that's an issue that's at the bargaining table, and there was a court case on that. That, um, So I'm not going to comment on that. And uh, I think the uh, you know, the city ordinance needs some work. Uh, the residency ordinance, it's, um, there's some flaws in it that I think the city council is looking at to, to, to revise and to work out. Um, but there was, no, uh, there was no laws broken by the Springfield Fire Department. Commissioner Conant didn't think the discipline was warranted. I really don't know. I mean, we have firefighters that live in a city and we have firefighters that live, out, live outside the city. And, uh, you know, my main concern is if they come into work and they do their job and, and they come into work every day, then, um, you know, I, I really doesn't matter to me. And it doesn't matter to, you know, somebody who's house on fire. When firefighters show up, they don't take a poll on where they live. So, um, and that's something for the city officials to be concerned about. I'm just concerned about my firefighters coming to work and doing their job. And despite police commissioner John Barbieri's efforts in leading the C3 policing, his days could be numbered as commissioner. The city council wants to eliminate the office of the police commissioner and instead have a civil police commission following recent allegations of police misconduct within the department. Mayor Sarno is deeply opposed to that proposal. Well, in the past, the interesting thing about it is that the police commission is supported by the mayor. The mayor does not support uh, the police commission and the city council overrode the veto. So I, there probably is going to be a little uh, uh, test of that. But uh, the in the past, the uh, mayor has appointed five commissioners and, and they review uh, police policy, they review promotions. That's where most people are concerned. You know, are the promotions fair? The, is it the person who scores the highest on the test getting the job? And, you know, it's, it's really an effort to eliminate uh, any kind of favoritism. And did you see that with Commissioner Barbieri? What started this process? And I think Commissioner Barbieri is doing a great job. I, I think there have been some very difficult issues facing the police department and uh, individuals in the police department who have kind of given it a black eye. But I think overall, he is a commissioner that I have seen out in the community at churches, at neighborhood groups, I mean, really making an effort, which I'm surprised at the backlash, he's really been making an effort to reach out to the community. But you think in general a commission would be better than a commissioner's I spot? I do. If the Office of Police Commissioner is eliminated, it wouldn't occur until Commissioner Barbieri's contract ends in 2019. The role public safety plays in Springfield is going to become even more important in the next few months with Union Station opening for the first time in more than 40 years this June. And just down the street from here, MGM Springfield will be opening in September of 2018. If the city wants to encourage visitors to walk from Union Station to MGM and make stops along the way, it needs to make sure everyone stays safe. When we come back on 22 News In Focus, we'll take a look at how new and longtime economic drivers in the city are all making sure they make investments in this renaissance period. I'm standing by Bridge Street in what will soon be known as the Springfield Innovation District. In an effort to make the city more walkable, public and private businesses are investing in ways to clean up the streets, open storefronts, fuel innovation, and make the entertainment district into more of a dining district. We're seeing people making a choice to come into this district because they see what's happening here on the ground and they want to be a part of it and it's exciting. The catalyst for the Innovation District is the Springfield Innovation Center on Bridge Street by the intersection with Main Street. For years, this street has been in disarray. Empty, crumbling sidewalks had people walking away from Bridge Street, not onto it. 
What we're focused on is stimulating revitalization and economic development in Springfield. Restricted by limited tax money available for these projects, the city seeks help from Develop Springfield, a private nonprofit organization that relies on grant money and private investment. We do have uh, significant grants that came in to support this project from the state, private foundations, most notably Mass Mutual. Uh, and like with all of our projects, we're also using uh, historic tax credits to help make this work, and we are financing the balance. Develop Springfield began in 2008 as a way to help with improving the look and economic impact of State Street. Since then, Develop Springfield has taken on revitalizing old historic buildings to sell for commercial space. But this project, this is something completely unique. We focused on this group of buildings because clearly these were buildings that um, were, you know, needed new investment. Uh, they were underutilized, uh, suffering from deterioration, but also very, very visible. They are right in front of Tower Square Park. You can look directly at these buildings from the signature Class A office buildings downtown. So this was really the gateway to the district. This is what it needed to be. President and CEO Jay Minkara gave us a tour of these 24,000 square feet of mixed-use space among three adjacent buildings. We're going to have presentation space, staff offices. Uh, really, the, the focus here is going to be on uh, operating business accelerators. Right next door and open to the space, we're going to have what we're calling the Innovation Cafe. Uh, on the second floor, there's going to be co-working space. We also have some additional office space. We've got a uh, startup that came out of Valley Venture Mentors that is moving into the second floor. The third floor uh, is going to be a variety of different things. The rent is subsidized to encourage innovative startups and think tanks to move in. Springfield's Chief Economic Development Officer Kevin Kennedy said the city's private business relationships are key to long-term economic success. What we're trying to accomplish here is not just government doing things. I mean, we need to get the private side um, off the sidelines, and frankly, they're off the sidelines. Um, most of two-thirds of the spending that, that we've reviewed here and announced here in, in some of our reports back to the public show that it's on the private side. One of the biggest economic engines will be MGM Springfield. The impact of it, frankly, is a billion dollars worth of spending. Um, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that's a big impact. Um, but the other part of it is, uh, and I think you see the reinvigoration of everything across the city, um, it gave us from a planning point of view the ability to look at our downtown and have a major investment in the south end, which was damaged by a tornado, a major investment in the north end of downtown in Union Station, and we filled in the middle with an innovation district and have a partner with Mass Development, and that's all moving along. He said the former entertainment district on Worthington Street still has to work on changing its reputation. How do you try to push out those types of businesses that might not fit in in that area to encourage more of the dining and less of the entertainment? I think what we lay out is the strategy and uh, try to make it work and work with everybody to um, to make things a little bit different, and but the private side has to buy into it. I mean, if they own the property, um, they have to make the investment, and they're the ones that are doing the leasing and all those kinds of things. A walking distance away, MGM Springfield will be the first MGM resort-style casino to incorporate the cityscape into its design rather than keep visitors inside its four walls. As part of that decision, MGM decided to scrap a 25-story glass tower that would have been central to the design. MGM Springfield President Mike Mathis admits part of the reasoning for the change was the rising construction costs in the greater Boston area. Do you still stand by that decision to get rid of it? The removal of the tower was a big emotional issue for a lot of people, and, and I understand that because it was one of those really iconic elements of our design. Um, you know, the irony is that f the Gaming Commission, back when we received our approval back in 2014, and they hired a bunch of designers to review all elements of our project. You know, the only criticism we got, even though they were uh, they were really glowing about the design, was the the tower. They thought it felt like um, it was it was antithetical to the whole concept that we were doing down here, which was to integrate. So, upon reflection, I think we landed in a really good spot. Um, and with the hotel on Main Street as a five uh, as a five st five level hotel, it really feels uh, more engaged with the Main Street and more accessible. So um, that part of it uh, feels good. I think in terms of how we got there, it was a combination of uh, looking at what we want to do with residential 
we thought residential felt better as an off property concept that freed up then the space on Main Street for the hotel. Some fear the more urban design won't catch the eye of passers by. No, I, I really don't think that's an issue. We've got a large marquee sign that's going to go in our garage. Um, as you drive through uh, this corridor on the 91, you can't miss our garage. It's a really dominant um, building and feature. And really, you know, what's unique about MGM is is our um, is the power of our brand and our database. As part of its agreement with the city, MGM Springfield is required to offer 54 market rate housing units. 35 of those will be located at 195 State Street, the former Springfield School Department building. The remainder will be the old Court Square Hotel, 31 Elm Street, just a block away from MGM. Another challenge he spoke candidly about, the relationship MGM had with the Springfield Historical Commission. Our relationship with the uh, Historical Commission um, has ebbed and flowed over time. You know, one of the, one of the things that we, we think sort of hurt us is we came in with a really aggressive preservation program right out of the gate because we thought a lot of uh, the cool design aspects of our project would be uh, incorporate some of the great buildings that were already on site. So we wanted to preserve the armory um, early on. Uh, we wanted to preserve the, the facade of 73 State Street, which is uh, the old um, electric building, and also keep keep the, um, the church and the office buildings that are on the corner. So we really didn't, the problem is we didn't really have anything to negotiate with them. And we, we gave them up front a lot of things that they would have asked for. So I think some of the challenges we had were in, in trying to get them comfortable that this was already a great preservations project and that they didn't need to push for some of the extra preservation that they were looking for. You know, we ultimately got to a good place, but um, I think that's what harmed us is we came in uh, so aggressively with our preservation program before we even had a conversation with them, and they felt like they needed to, you know, extract a little bit more from us. And would that be part of, would that extra extraction have to do with the hotel facade part that you had to preserve? Yeah, that one, um, that one was a little painful. Uh, as I understand it, President Polk, back in the 1840s, spent one night in that building. Um, and because of that, it, it, it turned it into a big preservation project. Um, it's funny, I watch television now and I, and I think about wherever Obama or Trump are staying on their travels and the aggravation they're going to cause one day to some developer because they spent a night on the way to some, um, some event. So uh, that, one, you know, that one we wouldn't have done on our own, but it, it, the work is underway and, and it'll be fine. And, um, you know, they've got great intentions, so we, we worked with them. Through our interview with Mike Mathis, we also discovered the massive parking garage you see from I-91 may not be free as was once believed. But there's a movement in our industry around f um, f converting free to paid parking, and a lot of that, again, is to manage capacity for our customers. So in Las Vegas, we started converting some of our garages to paid, and uh, our competitors follow suit. So. Uh, you know, I, I think for us, we've got to figure out what makes sense here in the region, which is why we haven't made a decision on that. And it's not a binary yes or no. I think depending on the volumes and what's going on uh, on promotions and holidays, uh, some days we'll, we'll probably want to make it paid just so that we make sure that we've got it available for our customers. Mathis said they'll look into what competitors Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun do. Well, 22 News found out for ourselves that both Connecticut casinos offer free valet parking. MGM Springfield's $950 million investment is just a third of the major investments coming into the city of Springfield. Across the city on Page Boulevard in East Springfield, the former Westinghouse site has been transformed into the $95 million China Railroad Rolling Stock Corporation, or CRRC Railcar Manufacturing Facility, the largest in the world. When it's complete this fall, the 204,000 square foot facility will employ about 150 workers with more hires expected. They've already signed a $280 million contract with the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority and $178 million contract with the Los Angeles Metro Board. Springfield boasts a long tradition of manufacturing and invention, but it's the fields of finance and healthcare that really catapulted this city into a new realm of economic success and opportunity for employment. Take, for example, Mass Mutual. This national life insurance company is and always has been headquartered right here in Springfield.
We've been part of the fabric of Springfield for generations, for many generations. The first president of Mass Mutual, Caleb Rice, um, was also uh, the first mayor of Springfield. And so, they're, you know, we're inextricably linked, if you will. For 165 years, Mass Mutual has been giving back to the community it employs. We employ over 7,400 people nationally, and several thousand of those people are here in the greater Springfield area. So as an employer, it's very important for us uh, to be invested in the community and, and helping the community be a better place for our employees, but also to attract talent and to attract other businesses and other um, interests to the, to the region. Dennis Duquette gave us a tour of the Mass Mutual headquarters on State Street. I think we are the largest employer, um, largest employer and have been for quite some time. Um, but, you know, being the largest employer is important, and I think there's, there's some significance that comes with that. But when you look at what's really fueling the economy these days, um, we're excited about, you know, smaller companies, smaller businesses. Uh, the entrepreneur community that is bubbling up in Springfield downtown, we think is very exciting. That's why we've invested in it. Duquette is the president of the Mass Mutual Foundation. It's an entity of the company focused specifically on writing grants and funding programs in the community, especially startups. Remember the Innovation Center? Well, Mass Mutual is a major contributor. After all, Duquette says their original 31 man company began all those years ago as a startup of sorts. He said investing in education is also a top priority. We have a unique opportunity because we're surrounded by great resources, you know, great educational institutions and uh, great thinkers that can actually come into this space or come into this ecosystem and actually make something happen for Springfield. Bay State Health also boasts employing the most people in western Massachusetts. We are by far the biggest employer, about 12,000 uh, employees or team members as we call them uh, in all the uh, three counties of the Pioneer Valley and uh, we contribute about four billion dollars a year to the local economy if you think about not only the jobs but the spending power of all those employees. It's roughly 10 percent of the economy of Hamden County. It serves even more than that. As far as the hospital capacity of Western Mass, we're about half of it. There are nearly a thousand beds, and that's roughly half the hospital beds in all the four counties of Western Mass. But we're way more than just a collection of hospitals these days. We're doctor practices. We employ about 600 doctors. I think we have about 90 different mailing addresses between all the various lab draw stations and the, the areas that support Bay State. Despite those statistics, Bay State did have to lay off more than 300 employees last fall. Bay State Health President and CEO Dr. Mark Kerouac said there was good reason for the cuts. He explained about two-thirds of patients are paid for by the federal government, but the government pays up to 25 percent less than Bay State's cost for the care, leading to a $50 million shortfall. He said Western Massachusetts doesn't receive as much help as the greater Boston hospitals do. It's because of the fact that in most large cities, there's a single hospital or hospitals that really focuses on the care of the poor. In Boston, that's Boston Medical Center and Cambridge Health. Uh, in other cities like Worcester and Springfield, uh, it's all under one roof. And so we're not only the hospital where poor people come in Springfield and Greenfield and, and uh, Palmer, uh, but we're also the referral center for the whole region. In a big city, those roles are split. And so when they figured out a formula to uh, distribute the extra monies, the supplemental funding, they tended to, s to favor those very specialized hospitals and ignore the sort of hybrid hospitals like Bay State. Dr. Kerouac said one goal is to attract Western Massachusetts natives to study locally and then work locally so they can invest back into the economy. One way they're doing that is a new medical school partnership with UMass. is one of the biggest challenges for Springfield schools and city leaders know that that can lead to a cycle of more poverty and future crime. So we looked at what the Springfield Public School System and one landmark college in the city are doing to better the community. Education is key not only for families but for workforce development and employment opportunities. This fiscal year, the city invested 63.9% of its budget on the Springfield Public School System. Still, the district, which is the second largest in the Commonwealth, faces setbacks due to its urban environment. I'd say poverty is the greatest challenge. 
uh, but a lot of times our poorest families also have the language barrier as well. 58 languages are spoken in the schools. At one time, some Springfield schools were failing, ranking the lowest in the state and threatening the district from being taken over by the state. But Superintendent Daniel Warwick found ways to improve. It's been a huge effort. We've put graduation coaches in every high school. We have complete online credit recovery programs available for kids during the day and in the evening. We, we made our summer and night school free so kids could have access because in a poor community, a lot of our kids couldn't access the, the credit recovery vehicle in summer and night school because they couldn't pay for it. He said the graduation rate is up 10% in the last five years, now to 68.8%. And the dropout rate was cut to 4.9%, the best improvement in the Commonwealth. Talking about the arrests in the schools, we've cut the arrests down to the schools from almost 500 to 80 last year. So do we have police in the schools? We have school resource officers, but it's been a very positive experience. Springfield is the first in Massachusetts to offer free breakfast to all students in every classroom, even high schools, all funded by the USDA. There's been a lot of studies and research. If a youngster comes to school hungry, they end up going home sick more often, they're not as focused. So even the achievement rates when they've done studies increase. But it's just the right thing, right way for a student to start a day. They're also pioneering a new education experience with the Springfield Empowerment Zone Partnership. Eight participating schools serving more than 4,400 students combine the best practices of a traditional public school and a charter school. The result? The schools have autonomy from the district, setting their own school day times and writing their own curricula, for example. The end goal for all district students isn't just graduation, but jobs, especially ones with those leading economic engines in our region, like CRRC and MGM Springfield. We have over 100 kids at Putnam right now that are actually working in jobs on their Voc Week in, in local businesses. Some of them will, will work for those businesses right away. Some of them will work for the businesses and move through, through college also. But uh, the, the success, our, our graduation rate at Putnam is over 96%. A bustling community within an urban environment, Springfield College has Springfield right in its name. I believe that uh, a college and, or a university that is sitting amongst a neighborhood really has a responsibility to the community that shares the name and shares the zip code. And so from my perspective, it's a relationship from day one uh, when Mayor Sarno came to my inauguration. We started talking about how we could be good partners. Springfield College's first woman president, Mary Beth Cooper, explained most students are from New England, but not from the city. A small percentage of Springfield students, we'd like to have more. We try to do a lot of recruiting this area. But the school is contributing back into the community. Students are helping neighbors by providing healthy cooking classes, offering stroke survivor clinics, building a baseball field with disability accessibility for neighborhood kids, and working on safety solutions and making sure that our blue lights work and making sure that, that we've got police officers or our public safety officers walking the, walking the campus. The campus officers carry guns mainly as a deterrent to would-be criminals. Cooper lives on campus with her family. When do things do happen in the surrounding area, they are, they are aware of it because it's right next to it. But part of, you know, from my perspective, there's good neighbors that live right around us as well that are raising families. And so to say, that it's a you know problem right around campus is, is unfair because we've got individuals that are trying to raise families that, are, that want good lighting and they want police protection as well. And so I think working with them has been, from our perspective, an important thing to do because we, they want to be safe as well. It's easy in our daily lives to pass through the city of Springfield and not really notice what's been going on. In this hour of 22 News in Focus, we hope you've learned how your tax money is being put to use for public safety, education, and future developments here, and why city and state leaders say they're hoping for a promising future for the city of Springfield. That's our program for today. I'm your host, Kate Walsh. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope that you watch it in full at any time on our website at WWLP.com. From all of us here at 22 News, have a wonderful Sunday.